Hello, folks. Uh, I'm Dieter Shirley, and I want to talk a little bit today about uh, resource-oriented programming. So resource-oriented programming is uh, probably a new topic uh, to most folks. So uh, this is just going to be an over overview and introduction so that you get a sense of, of what it is um, and why it exists and, and, and why it matters. Um, so the, the background here is, is that whenever software moves into some sort of new domain, domain or the, the nature of how software is delivered changes, um, we need new programming paradigms. Uh, and so I give some examples of that. So in the early days of computers, uh, computers were sort of a one-off thing, right? Um, you know, the famous quote from the uh, president of IBM at, at one point was, is that there is going to be a global worldwide marketplace of, of, um, of about five computers. Um, and, and of course, you know, at that time when computers were such specialized equipment, um, every piece of software was written bespoke for that computer because it was, they were multi-million dollar uh, installations. Um, but as computers got cheaper and we started to have, you know, sort of the beginnings of commodity hardware, it became really important that code could be written for one computer and run on another, what we call portable code. Later on, we, we started to have relational databases in the 70s. And so the idea of being able to do atomic transactions was a new programming paradigm. When the graphical user interface was introduced in the 80s, we saw that uh, object-oriented programming was a, a new paradigm that was perfectly suited for that environment because suddenly software was dealing with, you know, these, these virtual objects in the, in the forms of buttons and, and uh, menus and, and windows. And then when the web came out, we started to have client-side scripting. And this was fundamentally a different way of running software. Previously, software would be, you know, written by somebody, compiled into a binary for a particular kind of computer and then you know, in, installed uh, typically, in some cases, in a very involved process that could take as many as hours, as long as hours. And that software would run very efficiently on that computer, but the setup time was, was very long. When we moved to the web, we wanted to be able to download these little JavaScript programs, and, and as time went on, even more complex JavaScript programs, and run them on any computer, regardless of what kind of hardware it was running. And to keep that, that, uh, that execution environment efficient, but also safe so that the code had significant limits on what it was able to do it. And when, whenever we saw these new paradigms become important, we saw new languages develop, brand new computer languages. And so for portable code, we saw the development of languages like Fortran and C. When we had relational databases and we wanted atomic transactions, we developed the language called uh, SQL or SQL. Um, Object-oriented programming led to the creation of, of Smalltalk, one of the very first, and, and of course Java, which was maybe even the most popular um, object-oriented programming language. And client-side scripting, of course, everyone knows, is, is all built around JavaScript. And so when we look at software moving into the blockchain, uh, we're talking about a new domain. So what's different about this new domain? And I think that the two primary things that are different about software running in blockchains that we've seen is the ability for creating scarce assets. Um, and you know, we're used to thinking of assets as sort of you know that term referring to financial things, but of course, you know, we think of CryptoKitties as scarce assets too. And that's part of the magic of CryptoKitties is that yours is different than everyone else's. And what happens when you breed your kitties together is different than what happens when everybody else does. And that scarcity, that individuality of those, of those cats, if it weren't protected by the blockchain would make for a much less interesting ecosystem. And of course, it's no good in having these scarce assets if you're not able to control who accesses those assets. It's not very useful to have every CryptoKitty being different if anyone can breed your CryptoKitty or anyone can breed any CryptoKitty. That notion of ownership, that notion of having some individual control conferred by that ownership is a big part of what makes the blockchain software interesting. And so let's take a look at how we represent things in software as data structures and what properties we'd like to see in these scarce digital assets. So data structures uh, form the basis of how software works, right? When you are um, building any sort of model inside a computer, you're using you know, structured data that we call data structures. Um, and in order to make this efficient, there's been a lot of effort gone into programming languages to make the data structures 
as easy to use as possible. So they're easy to create. Um, they're typically very easy to copy and make new versions of. Um, and when you're done with them, they're, they're very easy to, to get rid of. In fact, the easiest to program languages typically have a reference counting or garbage collection, meaning that when you're done with an object, you just stop using it and the system notices and, and automatically reclaims the, the memory used by that object. But of course, when we're dealing with scarce assets, especially assets of value, it's the, in many ways, the exact opposite. We, we have to be very carefully controlled creation. If anyone could create any CryptoKitty, then that would completely devalue all the other CryptoKitties. If anyone could create um, their own, uh, a, a brand new uh, copy of a token into the digital realm. And of course, you don't want it to be the case that these valuable scarce assets just disappear accidentally. Um, obviously, the, the, unlike the duplication or, or what you might call counterfeiting case that, um, that maybe losing these assets is, is, is less harmful to the community, but it's certainly very painful to the person who lost those assets. And so the interesting problem that we ran into when we were looking at, when we were building our own software and we were looking at building our own blockchain is, is that in Solidity, and in Wasm, you are asked to develop these scarce resources. And the only tools you're given are the tools for managing data structures. And so there's nothing about the language that is giving you um, specific um, support for managing these scarce assets. You have power of data structures and data structures are really valuable. I'm not saying we wanna get rid of data structures even in a blockchain context. But if you're trying to represent uh, scarce resources as data structures, and we'll go back to this table again, you'll see that it, the onus falls on the programmer. Every single programmer of every single smart contract that's creating scarce resources has to take something that is fundamentally easy to create and copy and destroy and make sure that they're very carefully putting controls around its creation. Make, take care to make sure that nothing about it can be copied. Make, take, take care to make sure that things can't actually be just accidentally be destroyed. And so th this was noticed by uh, a, a bunch of researchers. And so I, I've got here uh, a few different papers. Um, and what they noticed was that there is a, a concept in computer programming called linear types. And linear types seem to be, uh, these researchers identified that linear types were a much closer match to the needs of scarce resources than traditional data structures. And so let's take a look at what linear types are. So linear types, they have easy creation and, and make it easy for, for you to create them. But instead of making it so that you can easily copy them or share references to them, linear types explicitly make it so that they're uniquely referenced. Then when the linear type, when you're done with it, you have to be very explicit about uh, the destruction of it or the release of it. And so what we see here is, is that it's a lot closer to what we want in scarce assets. Now, the difference between uniquely referenced and uncopyable is actually pretty subtle. So yes, technically it's different, but the bookkeeping you have to do to make sure that something is uniquely referenced and the bookkeeping you have to do to make sure that something isn't, uh, isn't accidentally copied um, is, is almost identical. And so it turns out that linear types have a very similar set of properties to what we want to see in scarce assets. And so that was when the idea of resources was first conceived. And so what resources are is it's linear types that have more control around their creation. Um, and and uh, for, for those of you who are, who are more technical, uh, I'm using the phrase controlled creation to actually refer to very strong typing and, and making sure that it's not possible to um, to change the type of a data structure um, and, uh, and sort of create a, a, a copy of a data structure out, out of thin air um, without it going through the, the, uh, the code that defines that data structure, um, defines that resource. And uh, you need to have runtime support. So the runtime support point is a little bit subtle. So imagine you, uh, th th this diagram here walks you through sort of the basic way that source code turns into a smart contract running on a blockchain. So you have your source code, you run it through your compiler, that produces some bytecode, which is a uh, very compact and efficient way of representing the logic uh, from the source code. That bytecode then gets uh, packed into a transaction that is uploaded to the blockchain, and then the blockchain runtime executes 
uh, that bytecode when that smart contract is, is used. And linear types are enforced by the compiler and only the compiler. Now, this is because the whole point of linear types and the reason why linear types were of interest to computer scientists in the world before blockchain is because linear types allow for much more efficient memory management. And anyone who's done anything adjacent to software programming knows that memory management is, is one of the hardest problems for software engineers to deal with. And the, um, the neat thing about linear types was is that you could put the logic for managing linear types in the compiler and you could have very robust memory management that didn't need to be in the runtime. The point of linear types was to take logic out of the runtime where it can potentially uh, cause you uh, slightly degraded performance and move all of that logic into the compiler. But in the blockchain context, that doesn't help us because somebody who is malicious and trying to undermine your system can create a smart contract, run it through the compiler, have all of the rules for linear types enforced by the compiler, but then go and manipulate the bytecode to break those rules. And so if those rules are only enforced in the compiler, there's this window for a hacker to come in and modify the code. And you can't be sure that those linear type rules will be respected by every single smart contract on the system. And so resources need to have logic in both places. You need to have logic in the runtime and you need to have logic in the compiler. Technically, you'd only need to have the logic in the runtime, but of course, it'd be a pretty bad compiler that didn't warn you about things that you were doing um, that were going to fail at runtime if, if it was able to detect that. And so that means that our poor hacker can't do much. They can bypass the checks in the compiler and manipulate the bytecode, but once that bytecode gets uploaded to the blockchain, the, the runtime itself is going to uh, protect the, uh, the rules enforced by those resources. And so now we have from resource-oriented programming, we have the ability for managing scarce assets. Now, the second thing I said was controlling access to those assets. Um, and it, it might seem like this doesn't really help us there, but it turns out, and I'm gonna have to rush through this a little bit because uh, my technical difficulties earlier, but there's a, a, a security model called the capability-based security model, or uh, you also see it referred to as the object capability model. And it's a different way of doing security. So often when we think about security, we think about an access control list model or ACL model, where what you can do depends on who you are. Whereas the capability-based security model is a, a model where what you can do depends on what you have. So it's sort of an access token model. And capability-based security, we don't see it that often because it really depends. It, it has a lot of really great properties, like it allows for greater separation of concerns, more flexibility. The systems tend to be much easier to audit uh, for correctness and security holes. But we don't actually see it very often in the world because it requires special runtime support. But it turns out that the runtime support you need to handle capability-based security is almost exactly the same runtime support you need for resources. And so with very little extra work, a resource-oriented system is can be also a capability-based system. And so we sort of get the best of both worlds where we're managing these scarce resources and controlling access to those resources all by adding this new paradigm. And so we add a whole new paradigm, resource-oriented programming in this new domain of blockchain, and we add new languages. So resource-oriented programming has already spawned two languages, move and cadence. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what the heck? You're just, I've never heard of resource-oriented programming. And now you're telling me that there's already two different languages that implement this. Um, and the, the fact is, is that there are two. And, and the, the great part is, is, is that they're not competitive. So Moved was developed by the uh, Libra um, blockchain team and is a resource-oriented programming language. And cadence was developed by the team at Dapper Labs uh, for use on Flow. And the reality is, is that they're not competitive at all. In fact, they're like peanut butter and jelly. Um, they both you have resources as a, a first class type built into the, the, the language. They both are built with security from the ground up. But Move is a very low level efficient language um, that doesn't have a, an, an especially ergonomic syntax yet. Whereas Cadence is a very high level, easy to read language, incredibly ergonomic syntax inspired by modern languages like Swift and Rust. Um, and 
we're working right now to make sure that Cadence can compile down into the Move bytecode so that um, Cadence and Move can actually work together. Move is, uh, even though developed by uh, specifically for the Libra blockchain, is developed as a retargetable VM and can be supported in other blockchains. Um, and so we are looking forward to working with the Move team. Um, they've they've been very open and helpful to us. And so we'll be compiling Cadence uh, into the Move VM, and um, we'll. Uh, hopefully be integrating the Move VM into our blockchain and get the best of both worlds, a high level ergonomic language with great low level efficient performance. Uh, thank you everyone for your time. Um, we, we have a, a, a Discord uh, channel, lots of our team is in. So uh, if you, if you wanna find that, uh, it's linked from onflow.org. Um, we'd be uh, happy to talk to you there. So thanks everyone for joining the Dapper Labs team and, and all of the folks working on Flow, and uh, uh, we hope you enjoyed our presentation.